Yes, I'm actually very glad to be speaking after dinner. I believe that uh, once people have eaten, they're uh, quite satisfied and much more open-minded uh, to hearing new views. And surely that will be reflected in the questions and comments uh, after the talk. Uh, when I was invited and I read uh, the conference invitation, it was saying that uh, at this conference we do not intend to discuss narrow solutions for how to adjust particular exceptions to copyright in one jurisdiction or another, which put me in a difficult position because this is what I do all day. Um, but uh, I have taken this to heart and I do want to take a step back instead and look at what uh, all these discussions around a possible need for new exceptions may have in common. And I believe that uh, quite a lot of these discussions revolve around attempts of bringing to terms on the one hand, the exclusive rights that exist in copyright and the reality, the new realities of the digital environment. Now, uh, what are these exclusive rights? In very simple terms, uh, the exclusive rights in copyright determine what somebody can do with a copyright protected work. So uh, on the one hand, for example, reading a book or listening to a piece of music is not a use that is uh, pro uh, covered by an exclusive right. So you do not need permission to read a book. But uh, to find out what you do need permission for, uh, you can look at the person who gave you the book or who played the piece of music to you. So you have uh, exclusive rights such as uh, the public performance of a work, the distribution of a work, the making available of a work, uh, and indeed uh, the reproduction of a work. And since uh, we're talking about the ethics of copying, this is uh, what I want to be focusing on. And, um, I want to uh, start this exploration with an example uh, from my life, uh, a friend of mine uh, called Enno, who is the uh, president of the German Cyborg Association, wears a cochlear implant. This is a digital hearing aid. And uh, th what this hearing aid does is that whenever Enno uh, hears a sound, um, there's a microphone in this hearing device that uh, um, transforms the analog signal into a digital signal and uh, creates impulses that uh, communicate with an implant in his brain. And uh, from a purely exclusive right perspective to copyright, every time he were listening to a piece of music, uh, he would be making a reproduction of this work and therefore would require permission from the rights holder. Now, uh, of course, I, I can reassure you this is not actually the case because uh, thankfully there are exceptions to copyright and uh, in the European Union one mandatory exception to copyright exists and that is uh, the exception for temporary or transient copies that are integral to a technological process. So in this case you can say quite easily, well this this copy is clearly temporary, it only takes place in the moment, the things that he is hearing is, are not recorded, although they could be, it, you could change the device to allow him to record it, uh, and this copying is necessary for the technological device to function. So in this case it's quite clear this is not a copyright infringement. But actually this exception to copyright was fought over quite violently uh, back in 2001 when the copyright directive was passed into law. And at the time, the European Publishers Council argued that actually introducing this exception to copyright protection would bring about the end of their business models. Um, the main purpose of this exception, or what was discussed at the time, was uh, the transition of works over networks. So uh, every time you look at a website, for example, uh, a copy of whatever is on that website is being made. So you go to a particular URL and let's say there's a video there. In order for you to be able to watch this video, which is not a copyright relevant act, somehow this work needs to get to you. And this is done by uh, the internet service provider sending a copy to you. And, uh, but this copy is not stored on your end, so it's purely temporary, and it's solely made for the purpose of facilitating the communication. So at the time, the rights holder said, well, we can't make this dependent on the permission of the right holder, otherwise the communication with digital technology simply wouldn't work. So in this case, the... In, the uh, internet service provider is not liable in the case uh, of the copy that uh, it is making over a network in order to show you that video. And quite importantly, it also doesn't matter from the perspective of the internet service provider whether this video was put online legally or illegally. 
So the European Publishers Council at the time said that uh, this exception was a gaping hole in right holders' protection under the reproduction right, and it explained that this reproduction right was the core right in both the analog and the digital world, so arguably more important than all the other rights, such as public performance, distribution, and so on. So what happened when this terrible exception was adopted into law? Actually, nothing much. No big problems arose that weren't there beforehand. But uh, you can actually look at a cautionary tale from other jurisdictions. In Canada, the legislature failed to provide a really clear exception for these transient copies over network. And in the, indeed, the rights holders' demands in Canada um, led to a certain legal uncertainty over quite a lot of time. Uh, in which it was difficult for the internet service providers to tell uh, what, what kind of uh, liability they were facing. And uh, indeed, for almost a decade, uh, the, the broadband, slow, uh, broadband rollout in Canada was uh, relatively slow compared to other comparable countries. Uh, until this law was uh, finally appealed and interpreted by the Supreme Court uh, of Canada in 2004. And you could now argue whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but today, uh, when we're looking at the uh, discussions around exceptions and limitations to copyright, uh, we are seeing quite a similar debate. Uh, that is the debate around text and data mining. So like the temporary copying exception allows my friend Enno to listen to a song with the help of a computer, uh, the text and data mining exception allows you to read a book with the help of a computer. So um, the text and data mining is the act of analyzing some text or other data that may be uh, protected by copyright with the help of a computer. And uh, this requires that you take the work and copy it into a database uh, and, uh, and then run an algorithm over it. So clearly there's a, a copying taking place and it's a digital reproduction. Therefore, this is relevant to copyright. And uh, also, like with a temporary copying exception, the lobbying against these text and data mining exceptions relies on a certain level of technical illiteracy, that uh, people have trouble, if they're not really familiar with the way that computers work, to realize what uh, the outcome and what uh, the dangers or possible risks of an exception could be, as opposed to the risks of not passing this exception. Um, so one of these claims uh, that is put forward mostly by academic publishers is that text and data mining is a highly complex activity that can only be done by experts and uh, that normal researchers require some kind of expert tools that are provided to them by the publishing houses. But uh, even though it's this really complex activity and people rely on uh, commercial services by the publishers for some reason, it's not enough to simply offer these services as a, as a commercial offer, but rather the text and data mining itself needs to be uh, a copyright protected activity, so say the publishers. Uh, in fact, text and data mining is something that anyone with some basic programming skills can do. Uh, at its very core, text and data mining is simply finding the needle in the haystack. You have a huge amount of data that you couldn't possibly read and analyze all by yourself. So instead of having to go through it and spend years uh, simply reading, um, you can use an algorithm to identify what might be the most relevant parts of the material and uh, potentially perform some calculations to describe that material that will then help you in the further steps of your research. Um, so uh, another claim that, that, uh, that uh, publishers are making with regards to text and data mining is that uh, performing it puts a high strain on the publisher's servers. Um, I was uh, in a discussion with uh, the publishing house Reed Elsevier and uh, they were explaining to me that doctors in the emergency room need to go to these uh, databases of uh, research papers when they're treating Ebola patients and they may just have three minutes, uh, otherwise the patients will die. And um, in fact, doctors in the emergency room do not usually consult research papers while on, on the fly while taking care of their patients in the emergency room. Um, just a third claim, and I will come to, to my point with all of this, is uh, the claim that uh, you, you don't need an exception for this activity, you can just get a license from the publishers instead. 
the problem with this assumption is that it assumes that all material that you could possibly want to data mine is owned by large academic publishers and that there's a relatively small number of them. Um, but in fact, any material can be mined, whether it's copyright protected or not. So that could be online videos or illegal shopping websites or social media postings, all kinds of things. So depending on what you find out, you may be dealing with millions of individual rights holders and the transaction costs of trying to secure a license with all of them can be astronomical and you can't even rely on a collecting society to do that for you because they may be located all over the world. Um, so, if you tried to uh, approach some of these rights holders with the request, hey, can you give me a license so ca I can uh, perform text and data mining on your cat picture, they would probably look at you like you're a crazy person. And indeed, not a lot of people actually do this in, in reality. Uh, just one example why this is relevant. Uh, a few months ago, there was some news about the UK suddenly have to, having to pay more to the EU than they had previously ex expected. Um, this news was due to a government-funded study that was done uh, by a private company for the UK government. And uh, this study was supposed to estimate the size of the UK black market economy. Uh, text and data mining was part of what this study was doing. Um, and the researchers were uh, looking at um, black market websites, for example, illegal prostitution websites. And obviously, in this case, the owners of the websites that were analyzed were not interested in cooperating with the researchers. So approaching them and asking them whether they want to give you a license may not be a, a good strategy. So uh, why am I examining all these arguments uh, by publishers around text and data mining? It's to d uh, illustrate that it is incredibly difficult to push through even the most obvious and necessary and tiny changes to copyright in the form of a new exception. Uh, if the resistance to any progressive change to copyright reform in the sense of giving more flexibility uh, to the copyright system or giving more rights to the users of copyright protected work, if that resistance is always equally high and determined more by the resource of the lobbyists in question than by the gravity of the actual change, then aiming at one radical change rather than continuous updates may actually be more desirable and uh, have a bigger chance of success. Of course, uh, the text and data mining is performed all the time and uh, outside of the EU, it's clearly legal in a lot of jurisdictions. And um, I just want to mention this uh, uh, because of what was said in the previous uh, um, lectures. The District Court of Amsterdam recently actually ruled that prohibiting text and data mining on the grounds of copyright was a disproportionate impingement on the fundamental freedom of research. Um, I hear what Professor Rigamonti has said about uh, external constitutional defenses, and uh, it's true, I would say, that uh, progressive lawmakers try to give more room to, uh, or more flexibility to the courts, because in the current system it is more likely that uh, um, a positive outcome will come from that than from simply the legislative process. And uh, I also have to admit that uh, it, it, it doesn't really shine a very good light on our own opinions of the legislative process if we, if we think that this is the most successful uh, way forward. But uh, the sad reality is that the room for interpretation through we less well-defined rules is all we're going to get if uh, the overwhelming influence of uh, copyright uh, industries continues the way that we have it at the moment. And uh, Professor Regamonti was saying that uh, if France is unable to improve its copyright, well, maybe they should suffer for it. Well, I, I have two problems with this argument. One of them is that it's quite unfair to the French public that is being held hostage by a quite influential industry. And uh, the other is that the rest of Europe is suffering with them. Uh, the harmonization of copyright uh, historically in the EU has always gone to uh, the highest level of protection and this is even held up as a principle. I think it's even in my report somewhere it says, yes, we should harmonize, but at a high level of protection. So in other words, that means if France is not getting it right, Europe is not going to get it right. So if we want to improve or if you want to leave the improvement of the copyright systems to the legislators, so to me and my colleagues, and not to the courts, uh, we're going to need a lot more outspoken public and academic support for it. 
Uh, otherwise, we're going to be left with uh, Professor Polkart's suggestion of kicking the lawmakers into action through uh, judging the copyright itself unconstitutional. I uh, find that very interesting, but uh, I think the great thing about democracy is you can also kick lawmakers without having to rely on the constitution. That's uh, your right. Uh, but back to tax and data mining. Um, I think uh, it, it seems pretty absurd to keep this really essential activity of a digital world that makes up the majority of the data traffic on the internet to keep that in legal gray zone, just to flee, uh, please a few academic publishing houses that are already among the most profitable companies in the world. Uh, using the temporary copying exception for text and data mining is technically possible, but it's very inefficient. You could try to go to the original source of the information and somehow perform the operation on that and just try to extract the fact from it, but it would be really inefficient and there would be no benefit to anyone from you doing that when you can just copy the material into a database and do the same thing in a much more efficient way. But the problem is, if you do text and data mining in an efficient way, the copy that you have in your database is no longer transient, it's no longer temporary. So the exception to copyright does not apply. So to sum up, this temporary copying exception makes the use of, technology, of digital technology possible. Without it, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to do much of anything with digital technology nowadays as soon as uh, copyrighted content is evolved. But this temporary copying exception was a patch to a bigger problem, and uh, this patch has its limits. Um, just want to be a little bit experimental here. Uh, let's imagine the example of surveillance cameras, and you can correct me if I'm wrong afterwards. Uh, if a surveillance camera in France, uh, which is a uh, country uh, that does not have freedom of panorama, if this surveillance camera is pointed at the facade of a building that is protected by copyright, is that a copyright infringement? Um, so the freedom of panorama means that you can make use of a, a copyright protected work um, that is located in a public place permanently. So usually we're talking about buildings, works of architecture or works of sculpture. You can make use of that work without having to ask permission from the architect. So. Um, I would argue the legality of the surveillance recording of this uh, artwork depends on whether the security footage is immediately deleted or not. So if it is stored for review later, it's certainly not a temporary copy. Um, another exception that could possibly apply is that of incidental inclusion. But uh, my point is more that in any case, uh, you have to do a lot of copyright exception gymnastics to somehow bring this really everyday digital technology use into conformity with the reproduction right. Uh, the same question poses itself with the uh, Google Street View cars. Um, Google Street View drives around uh, the city, makes pictures of public buildings, um, certainly does not store them only temporarily because it puts them on the internet later. So temporary copying exception is out. Um, and I would say even under the German freedom of panorama, um, the legality is questionable because uh, in the Hundertwasserhaus ruling, uh, it was established that the photographer taking the uh, picture of the public building also has to be standing in a public place. And I would argue that it's at least questionable if you have a two meter high camera floating around uh, a city somewhere. Also, I think incidental inclusion doesn't really apply because the sole purpose of taking the picture is showing a picture of the building. So uh, the question I want to raise is not whether street surveillance is illegal and also not whether Google Street View is legal and not even whether I think they should be legal. Uh, what I question is whether copyright law should be the tool to answer this question. The digital revolution means that increasingly our perception is going to be mediated by digital technology. And increasingly this will not just apply to people who have sight loss or hearing loss. I'm talking about everything from hearing enhancement headphones, VR goggles, touch sensors or simply smartphone cameras. The mere perception of the world around us was never supposed to be covered by copyright. But that is illustrated by the really simple um, idea that listening to a song does not require permission. But as technology progresses, 
every few years we have to introduce a new copyright exception to maintain this balance or to restore this balance. But every time it's a huge struggle uh, with powerful lobbies trying to stop any change that is merely intended to keep the reach of copyright within its limits. The next exception after the text and data mining debate is already on the horizon. Uh, the distributors of digital content online, so the big streaming services, are complaining that uh, in order to stream a video to their customers, it's not enough to secure the right of communicating this work to the public. They also need to clear the reproduction right. And in some cases, this right may not even be held by the same right holder. Uh, that's simply the case because a lot of the films were made before digital technology was around. Uh, making available communication to the public was not really a thing. So the uh, authors may have sold the reproduction right and uh, the public performance right to one rights holder and then at some point later sold uh, the making available right to somebody else. Um, in the worst case scenario, clearing the rights for streaming a video EU-wide may require licenses from two entities per country, so 56 different entities. And uh, knowing this makes it quite apparent why this video is not available in your country is such a common grievance for consumers. The irony is that the distributors have absolutely no use for making digital reproductions of their video, except for facilitating the communication to the public. So in, instead of having to temporarily copy the video every time uh, a consumer makes a request to view it from one server that is uh, situated in the rights holder's building, um, they want to have multiple copies of the video located on multiple servers in different server farms, um, in different physical locations, simply to speed up the delivery of the stream to the customers. So the reproduction that is taking place is simply a byproduct of making the communication to the public more efficient. So their demand is now to make a new exception that if somebody has already cleared the right of communication to the public, the reproduction rights should somehow be implied in that, in so far as it is necessary, the reproduction is necessary to facilitate the communication to the public. I would go a step further. Um, if all the instances of digital copying that don't involve an element of making available or distribution uh, are eventually covered by an exception anyway, and we just need to fight really hard and long to get there, then do we need the digital reproduction right in the first place? Uh, do the reasons that made us build our entire copyright system on the foundation of the act of copying still apply in the digital world? Do the benefits justify the massive collateral damage to the development of digital technology? So I've been asking myself what exactly the reproduction right is trying to achieve. Uh, this, I acknowledge that this right may have several purposes and I'm not saying that uh, the purpose of the reproduction right I'm going to pres present to you uh, is the only conceivable one. Uh, it's just the only one that I could conceive of. So I'm looking forward uh, to your ideas about what the reproduction rights really good for. Um, I argue that uh, the main purpose of the reproduction right is uh, to be a tool for improving the copyright enforcement. Uh, if somebody has 20,000 physical copies of a book in their basement, you can be pretty sure that they intend to distribute them to other people at some point. By making the copying itself a copyright infringement, you don't have to wait for them to actually make a sale and catch them in the act in order to sue them. And that's quite useful. You, you can also achieve an injunction that allows the copies to be seized and destroyed. That would be impossible without the reproduction right because up to the second of an actual distribution of the book taking place, having the 20,000 copies would be completely legal. So how does this situation translate to digital copying? Uh, a film distributor that offers streaming services over the internet to 20,000 customers does not store 20,000 copies of the film on their local hard drive and then sends out one and deletes it from their uh, hard drive afterwards. So uh, the idea of an injunction that forces the rightful owner of one copy of the film to delete the 20,000 copies that they made is obviously nonsensical because making another 20,000 copies is virtually free of charge, unlimited and instantaneous. So this injunction would not actually change anything. On the contrary, the copy is only created in the very moment in which the act of communication to the public takes place. So there is no copy 
until the customer requests for a video to be streamed. The copy is created in the moment of the, uh, the transaction taking place. So all the benefits of the analog reproduction right that allows the lawmaker to step in or the, the law enforcement to step in before any of the other exclusive rights uh, can be used, that does not apply in the digital world. And uh, the enforcement of the other exclusive rights is just as easy or as difficult without the reproduction right. So when dealing with an exclusive right that in the digital world has questionable benefits, but lots of disadvantages that regularly need to be patched by adopting new exceptions to copyright, perhaps a reform of the exclusive right would be the better policy option. Uh, the rep uh, reproduction right, of course, would not be abolished entirely. Um, I do see good reasons for or enforcement benefits for the analog equivalent of that. But uh, this reproduction right could be limited to analog copies and perhaps to digital copies that are permanently burned onto a durable medium and can't be overwritten. That would not mean that digital copies could simply be exchanged without restriction. Uh, the distribution, the making available, the, the communication of the public of, uh, to the public of works, all these would still require permission from the right holder. I believe I've heard a similar idea or close to that uh, in Eric Aramann's lecture when he said that as long as somebody makes a copy for their own benefit and is not making thousands of them to hand out to others, then that's not really a problem. And I would agree with that assessment, but this is not how the reproduction right works today. So whether you actually intend to pass your copies on to others or whether you make one copy or a thousand copies may matter for the scale of the infringement, but it does not for evaluating whether something is a copyright relevant use or not. So to be clear, I'm not talking about abolishing copyright. I'm talking about limiting copyright to those exclusive rights that actually compete with activities of the rights holders. Today, the digital reproduction right has become a liability for innovative technology companies, for research, for accessibility technology, and for the acceptance of copyright in the public eye. Getting rid of it uh, would require quite a lot of adjustments to the uh, underlying framework. Uh, particularly, there would need to be changes to the levies that are currently paid for some forms of reproduction, most notably the repography and the private copying levies. Um, the Repography is quite often analog anyway, and that could continue to be the place. And uh, one could also argue that it would be enough to, instead of compensating for digital repography, to uh, compensate for the distribution of these copies that usually takes place afterwards, for example, when the copies are being handed out to students. And one wouldn't even have to change the collecting of the levy to make this change. Uh, I would also like to mention that the per capita revenue derived from these levies is so small that uh, the same amounts could easily be made available in the form of public funding uh, for the arts and sciences. And uh, I think if policy wanted to go down that road, a solution for that could be found. Uh, of course, the bigger problem, uh, international treaties prevent this kind of radical change to our copyright systems. Uh, but I believe that radical change to copyright is inevitable. If we want to see this change in the form of a smooth transition rather than a violent collapse of the old system, I think it's necessary to explore options like the one I've presented to you today. Thank you very much for your attention.